today on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam people. And as I think about uh, gathering on this land and being here today, I want to sort of pose a proposition in thinking about this land acknowledgement and this exhibition and all of this programming around drift and our ciencia and thinking about the stories that we tell about this place and our relationship to this place um, to, and how we tell these stories through art and science. And throughout the drift exhibition, I don't know if you've had a chance to go through, uh, we've had, been running a parallel program uh, called Our Ciencia in collaboration with the Stuart Russell Quantum Matter Institute and the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And this has been an interdisciplinary research project, so it's the idea is to fuse the practices of art and science together. And in May, scientists uh, at UBC have been paired with a number of artists in a, in a residency that started in about uh, for over the last few months. And in November, the artists and scientists will be sharing their sort of findings and all of this collaborative work together uh, in a symposium. So we're really excited for that. And in the lead up to that symposium, we've been um, running a series of artist talks. And so that's why we're all here today. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce Kelly Lykin, who's one of the artists who's taking part in Arciencia, and um, who will be presenting on her work today. So uh, Kelly is a photo-based installation artist, and her work investigates the way objects and images are placed and displayed in the world, and the cycle of value they experience. So she employs photography and sculpture in order to engage them beyond medium specificity. And she's received a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, and a Master of Fine Arts from University of California, Santa Barbara, in Los Angeles. So her work has been exhibited across Canada, and the US, Europe, the Middle East, and this includes solo shows at AG Gallery in Tehran, the Brar Art Foundation, Susan Hobbs Gallery, Presentation House Gallery, SFU Gallery, or Gallery and Gallery TPW. So Lycan has also collaborated um, uh, throughout from 2005 to 2015 with the Arts Collective Instant Coffee, which we're all very familiar with. And um, it's a service-oriented artist collective um, who has uh, exhibited widely as well. So please join me in welcoming Kelly today, and thank you again for being here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, and and I, I just want to thank um, Tatjana, who, uh, uh, Shelly Rosenblum, um, she invited me to be part of the residency. There's like three other artists and um, several physicists. And then um, she's taken a leave, and Tatjana has gratefully stepped in. And um, it's been great working with her. Um, and um, yeah, so, so I guess just the talk I'm going to do is sort of in context a, a little bit of um, what's been happening um, in working with uh, physicists. Um, and so we were paired, or uh, some of us worked with three, some of us worked with one. Um, but uh, we were, um, physicists and artists gave presentations and then we sort of uh, established uh, who we wanted to work with, and the physicist that I'm working with is uh, Kirk Mad Madison. Madison, yeah, and um, uh, he generously um, informed me that he had this uh, photo collection that he acquired when he moved into a lab, and um, it was all this research from the '80s. So I, I, I kind of am going to, I've been adapted my artist talk in in relation to um, this photo collections of work that kind of relates and um, and then I'll show you some of the collection and, and talk about um, what I potentially see happening with the collection. Um, it's, it's kind of a um, special gift maybe that I received, I hope. <laughs> a gift or a burden um, when you receive collections <laughs> and archives, sometimes they're a bit overwhelming, but um, this one's quite beautiful. So. Um, so this is a box of one box of, of, of these images, and this just gives you a little taste um, for now. Um, um, and I guess, uh, yeah, I, I'm really fascinated. Um, I use photography a lot as a as a subject of my work, and also, also I'm really interested in the behavior of, of um, photography and the way that it. Um, deteriorates or fades or um, how it's invisible and then visible um, so and, and just how it 
uh, photography functions in our, our lives, like our pockets are full of photos, and um, you know, it's a way we enlarge and miniaturize ourselves, and the way we document our sen you know, sentimental moments and um, use for research. So it, it just the, the, multi, um, the multitasking nature of it is, um, I've always been fascinated by it, and have a kind of more formal photography training, but then I've always um, wanted to work around the edges, I guess, of photography and get outside of the grid of it and um, um, look at some of the stories, maybe, that and a, a more sub subjective approach to it. Um, and then, I guess, um, being an installation artist, this, this, uh, this image um, is very meaningful to me uh, that it's, this was sort of one of the first installation photographs that was uh, published in a magazine. And so it's that moment in the 60s where insta installation art was starting to be made. And so it was really, um, for a viewer, it wasn't about a discrete object and they had to move their bodies um, and engage with the work in a different way. And then how do you, how does that documentation translate for a, like a viewer in a magazine? So, so they started publishing installation photos. and. Um, <clears throat> and then this was um, um, a photo that I'll speak to several times. This is uh, Alfred Stieglitz. Um, uh, you can, it, it's a, from a, a, a gallery that was called Tuna. Well, it, it had an uh, earlier name and then it became 291. Um, and it was uh, a gallery that was in New York. And it was run by Alfred Stieglitz, Stieglitz, who was considered the grandfather of photography. And um, so his photographs are worth a lot. And so I'm fascinated ab about this kind of documentation, which is documentation of an installation, but it's taken by Stieglitz. And so, again, how, uh, how the value of a photo can... Um, uh, you know, they, they just function different, differently depending on the purpose. Um, and so this is an exhibition underglow that was at Presentation House, um, which is now Polygon. Um, this was a few years ago, but um, uh, I've always been interested in more of the back, the backgrounds of things, or like what are what are those support structures for us to to view art and um, exhibition design, um, exhibition history is always been a subject I'm interested in, and so um, there, this 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 uh, underglow is called was a three room installation, and so this this middle room as you come in, um, <clears throat> it was kind of so banal that you might not even know it's a piece, and uh, the, uh, so I looked at the uh, presentation tells archives, which is quite extensive, and I looked at all the installation photos, and um, I looked at the uh, different lighting systems that were uh, in, uh, employed in the past and uh, photographs that had, there was an archival image with the baseboards painted and so I added the light, the lights from the 80s and um, I, I uh, painted the, the baseboards, um, I added this mirror around the window frame or the door frame which was, um, had it been there for years um, I also, they have the original chairs from um, the 80s, and so I looked at all the installation photographs where these chairs were used, and every week I would change the configuration of the chairs depending on the installation photos. Um, and so, of course, when you come in, you would have no idea. Um, I guess my work is meant to sort of have this, I mean, this wasn't such a visual impact, but, um, <clears throat> you know, there's an experience and then you then you find uh, if you look deeper you find these um, more information. Uh, so I, I do like this as an animation. <laughs> that would have been a fun event. <laughs> and then that's such a typical uh, configuration in a gallery with the, the information. Um, and I just felt like that black line really um, tied this. Together. Also, the carpet, I really had an issue with there being a carpet in this space, and so I tried to um, use the carpet the best way I could. Um, so then you can see this little 
window or a doorway, which I made a smaller doorway, and so you walk into this room, and it's uh, totally uh, uh, based on this um, installation photograph. Um, so I, I tried to replicate it. I did a lot of research on what the lighting was like, and uh, so um, so it, it gave the viewer a sense of walking into a photograph, um, but it, it sort of was held together only at that point that you walk in and then and then the maison scene sort of breaks because um, you can see at a certain point that it, that it, it, it's a, a set. And then um, you could also, um, I guess I was, I was thinking about, um, you know, I'm always thinking about different modes of display and also this, the, um, the set being this other um, prevalent mode um, of display, and so I decided to, to reveal that, that part. Um, this was an autumnal, a, a, a consistent autumnal um, uh, uh, flower arrangement that they would consistently have in uh, the, the gallery. Uh, but just, uh, so the whole, uh, there's another um, part of this exhibition that I'm not showing, but uh, all the, the three different rooms were all uh, sort of shades of, of gray. I mean, this is a color photograph, um, um, but it's all um, uh, shade, shades of gray. And um, this gallery was open from 1905 to 1917, and it was uh, meant to, uh, you know, they, they were one of the first galleries to show sort of the avant-garde work from Europe, and, and initially it was meant to bring photography into the same uh, realm of respect as painting. Um, and so it was a really significant space in New York, really important um, space, and influenced what actually happened at, at the MoMA as well. And so I just, I really appreciated this uh, weird contrast of the decor and, and, and this um, really avant-garde uh, work that would have been shown in the space. Um, and so the exhibition was kind of this, uh, probably, a, you know, it's a whole lineage of um, exhibition history with uh, presentation houses history, then this history, and then in the other room, um, there was these photographs of, um, other interiors, uh, gallery interiors, that was quite abstract. But I guess, um, yeah, uh, it was it was that particular image that the Stieglitz, um, which will come up here actually, the Stieglitz um, photograph that uh, just inspired all this this this, this other work. Um, Yeah, so then the, the other show that came out of that photograph is called Little Glow, and it was at um, Susan Hobbs Gallery in um, Toronto. And uh, so I was, in my experience of researching um, 291, it's like you see all these uh, versions of the space, um, and it was like kind of this piece, piecing things together. Um, and you know, what, because um, Steichen was involved in, in 291, and I found an image of Steichen's photo, or studio before um, he got involved in Stieglitz, and you could see how there was elements, like the table that the flowers were on, I could tell that came from um, Steichen's uh, studio. So it was all this like um, research that I could do online, but also because the space is so old, there's all these um, um, images that are from, um, from books, so they have a, they have a different quality. So the, you know this sort of perpetual reproduction and the the uh, everything getting getting mediated through different lenses and um, internet um, sort of led me to this uh, this piece, um, which is really um, uh, I what I did is I took our screenshots or photographed books of the burlap. Um, there's a burlap uh, wallpaper in 291. Um, and so these are uh, these original images. There was five of these images of the burlap wall, and I had been doing a residency in New York, and 
I didn't have my printer with me and it was very frustrating trying to get a half decent image. I would go to photocopy places and um, I, I was, it was just going out of my mind. So I decided to, to turn that, that situation into um, an asset instead of a liability uh, by um, taking these five um, black and white photographs to a color photocopy place, giving it to them and taking back whatever I got. And so there was about a hundred places that I took these five originals to. And, um, and you know, it's kind of used, like the photo, I'm just kind of using the, 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 the uh, photocopier like, like a camera um, and um, uh, sort of embracing this, uh, relieving myself of the responsibility uh, for the image and um, embracing um, whatever the, the, the technology gave me. Um, it also was sort of a, a happy accident that um, it ended up looking, I guess I, that's not going to play because that's, no, that's a PDF, so. Um, that the, uh, the piece ended up looking not that dissimilar to, Stieglitz had this series called Equivalents that were considered one of the first abstract photos. Um, and they were pictures of clouds. And this piece ended up ha ha having this really atmospheric, atmospheric quality to it. Um, um, and also the, the paper kind of moved with the, um, so it had this animated quality, it moved with the, um, the uh, um, heating system, which was a nice, happy accident. And then I, um, upstairs at the gallery, I, um, again using Stieglitz photos, I just really emphasize these, um, doing the same kind of screenshot or photographing books I focused on the vases. Um, and I, I've always sort of, um, the, there's like consistently, do I have a, I'll go back to the original photo. Um, so consistently in all these installation photos, there would be these vases on the ledges. And they were never really identified, but they were uh, like consistently uh, part of these installation photographs. So I started doing, uh, capturing close-up photos of them and, um, uh, created these pieces. I guess I'm sort of interested in, in, in also the way that vase that 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 a vase has this um, practical pers per, um, purpose, but also it it's sort of this object. I use this term object in waiting a lot, and it's a sort of um, it, it has its own form of beauty, and but then it has a practical purpose. And so I, I like the way it um, traverses differently um, at different times in our lives and. Um, and also, it, you know, it's it's like an art form as well. So it sort of has that similar multi-purpose that photography has for me. Um, and then these were uh, photographs that were quite abstracted, depending on like some some of them were um, had a, a dot matrix abstraction, or some of it was just the um, digital um, noise. And then I. Um, I laminated them with this gold lamination, and so as your body moves, the light shifts, and so they, they sort of have this dynamic um, quality to them. Uh, and then the, I, I um, wallpapered the uh, walls with a newsprint, um, and the, the, the ledge is kind of mimicked 291 with this sort of um, very precarious uh, paper. I guess I think of this show everything works on paper. Um, and uh, so this paper, the, the uh, newsprint sort of changes color over over the duration and also, you know, um, photocopies kind of fade. So so all these materials are sort of in this um, slightly precarious state. Um, I really wanted to embrace the, um, the curl of the photo and um, uh, sort of taking it I've never really liked framed um, images, um, so kind of making a, a, a more dynamic viewer viewing experience, I guess, is always something I want to do. And this is a, a commercial commercial space, so um, you know you kind of make different choices around that idea. Uh, and then uh, this exhibition. Um, 
I'm, sh I'm showing it specifically because it is, uh, um, <clears throat> let me just get in it. Um, in reference to the photo, it, it's sort of an exhibition where I created an installation that then facilitated other artists' um, um, response to the ideas of the show. And uh, so it was based on uh, a space that was in Tehran, in, uh, and these are snapshots of that, from that space, uh, in Tehran in the, the early, or late 60s, early 70s, and it was called uh, Rash 29. And it was sort of a really significant space for um, um, artists and musicians uh, to, to hang out. Um, and there was a lot of uh, collectors. This, this woman is a famous American collector. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was just this kind of first, one of the first maybe artist run spaces certainly there. And, um, um, and coming from an uh, artist collective who kind of also worked in a similar way, this is appealing to me. So these, um, these photographs, with sort of the, um, the thing that I was interested in responding to and sort of anchored maybe the exhibition for the other artists as well. Um, and so I took elements from the photographs and um, <clears throat> also using the, um, I you know chose certain co like uh, colors um, from the images, some of the, the shapes and created these uh, uh, painted vinyls that then I rolled up in a tube and took to um, Tehran. I also designed these um, little display units. Um, these are just little maquettes and they facilitated the activity um, that happened in the exhibition. Um, um, and uh, so, so there's the installation part that could sh sort of shift around these benches, this curtain open and closed, um, and then these display units. Uh, they were metal, so they um, they were used in different ways. And so the you know when the gallery was open, these display units were sort of also there, like objects and waiting, like revealing to the viewer that um, uh, something in the future was there was an event or something in the future was happening. And then in the, uh, it was a very tiny space. It was kind of a, an intense project because the actual venue kept changing. And um, so then we had to figure out how to do these programs. Um, so the program that I'm sort of featuring is the, the audience stayed seated while the performance, three, um, performance circulated. Uh, so these were the three rooms. And so sometimes the viewer would circulate, um, uh, and then sometimes the performance would circulate for for the viewer. So the um, this performance that I was doing, I would um, the audience was sitting, and I would uh, bring in these these elements and engage the viewer with these elements, and they were all um, elements from the actual original um, 60s, 70s, so those photographs from the 60s and 70s. So this would have been this, you know, there was a stained, stained glass window, there was the uh, roses, the tablecloth, a similar chair, there was the glasses. So as I'm circulating with these objects from room to room, um, the curator, Alham, is uh, she's got all the photographs on um, one of the display units and she's rolling that around. And so she's telling the history of this space. And then another person is moving um, from room to room and she's um, reading interviews of people who had actually been to the space. So the viewer are getting all these fragmented elements. And, and so the, the, the um, so the, the photos sometimes Somebody might have already seen the photos, um, uh, and then I come in with these objects, and they recognize that those, these are the objects from the, the photos. So it unfolds for the viewers in, in, in different ways. So again, you can see the, um, the same goblets, the roses. Um, 
So it was a, a way of that, that's Elham um, describing the photos and the activities. So it was a, the, the the history gets sort of fragmented, and the um, but it's a way of knowing the photographs in a, in, in quite a quite a different um, maybe more unusual way than we would normally engage with any kind of archive. Um, and uh, yeah, so that would have been. This would have been, the, the interviews would have been printed here and, and an actor came and, and read them. <clears throat> so it was a way of introducing, it was sort of the first program that happened and then there was several other uh, programs um, that happened differently. But it was a way of introducing the audience to um, the history of Rash 29. And, um, uh, and so this was part of another program where um, Elham Talk, uh, gave, gave a um, history of exhibition design, but it started with the curtain being closed and then she, she pulled it and um, it covered the, the viewers. You know, of course, I was having some issues with um, the women all being veiled and it's like, no, I'm gonna veil everybody. Um, so you, ha you had to watch this uh, lecture through, um, through the veil of the 60s frosted pink, I guess. <laughs> And then um, there was another program where um, musicians circulated from room to room using the same display units. Um, and this is um, Daria Akai. Um, he he didn't come, but he um, he uh, it was the breaking of the fast, the Ramadan, and and so at the end of every performance there would be a uh, a meal. Um, and then Natalie Pershwitz, uh, she also had the audience um, perform um, for, for a different program. So I guess it, you know, it was this, um, this creating this um, uh, installation that then facilitated um, uh, other artists' needs, and I, I guess that uh, sort of uh, having collaborated for years and making work together, it was sort of a sort of like an interesting idea for me is how to um, how to still kind of make work collaboratively, but also um, separately. Um, and and I guess in my interest in this um, archive or this this photo collection I'm going to show you, um, I'm sort of interested in that concept of um, sorry, I'm saying interested a lot. Um, I'm fascinated about that concept <laughs> <laughs> um, of uh, you know taking this this uh, like those photographs and, and and then having them generate um, ideas outside of myself, but like through other artists and uh, physicists or you know like um, it just the p potential of other people responding to um, to an archive. And I just, I do love these um, photo collections and um, how uh, um, uh, they, um, I guess how they kind of exist as, uh, um, they, you know, formally, especially when there's, there's nothing like a stack in my, for me, I, I, I love a stack of images and um, also because then they have this kind of um, sculptural element, but the fact that they so they have they exist as this form as a as a c collective, um, and then but then they each of them had is their own their own individual image with their own kind of you know uh, imagery, um, and and so um, I guess there's sort of something special about the, the this massing of. of uh, imagery and, and the formal qualities it, ha it has, and the ex you know s sort of expansive imagery, so that there you know there uh, this idea of the collective and the individual, um, and uh, this is a work in progress that I was uh, this is a piece I was working on at um, Griffin Art Projects, uh, and it was a residency, and uh, there was this really expansive. Wall and I started making this panoramic piece and um, uh, and I started using this uh, photo collection of, for uh, this panoramic piece. I guess um, 
uh, sort of was like I maybe attached to this idea of it being panoramic because panoramas were usually made, paintings or um, were usually made with these significant world events, um, uh, like depicting world events or celebrating world events, and I sort of felt like we were all experiencing one. And, and the work was d definitely about um, uh, different interiors. Um, so there, like the studio was sort of a, a very apartment-like um, where I did the residency. And this, the fact that we were having this really overexposed, um, we were so overexposed to our domestic, our domestic interiors. And also they, you know, I was, I was um, having this experience of, I, you know, when the, the height of our pandemic, I had this experience of like scan, like scanning over all my loved ones' interiors and seeing them in their interiors, and and I wanted to know how what they were getting um, comfort from, like what objects they were getting comfort from, and I pe I asked people to send me photos, and they would send me um, house plant, a lot of house plants, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, and house plants are this very uh, they do, it's kind of nature in our homes, it's sort of fake nature, it also has, it deals a lot with, like, it's, it's colonized nature, and, um, but they, the fact is that they, they gave, they give us great comfort, and so I, I just started um, cutting them out of this material I was making with resin and tissue paper and um, acetate or mylar, and uh, amassing them um, with these photographs, um, which were also, they, these photographs were all set deck images from, I used to work in film and television, and, um, and so they were sort of surrogates for uh, interiors because, you know, you, you go, um, you have a crew and they go out and take photos of furniture and then you decide what pieces are gonna go and to create these sets in, or in different locations, and so, they also, all that furniture is also objects in waiting, waiting to be picked up and then, um, uh, you know, have this brief experience of being a complete interior and then taken apart again and then um, uh, until the next time. And so, you know, I, also the, the photographs, um, the photographs, they, they aren't taken with the intention of composition, or they they exist for practical reasons, but but now that they I've accumulated them over time, or you know I've saved them, and so they have a different purpose. So now the value of them changes, and also like the you know I started looking for um, amazing comp accidental compositions, or um, uh, so yeah, there's sort of a shift of value um, that happens. Um, with the, with the photographs. Um, also, I was really thinking a lot about the digital interiors and, and how um, I wanted this to sort of have a sense of that reflective zooming space and the participant windows and the, um, uh, and that we suddenly can see where people live and what they have on their wall and that, it, that it, it's incredibly intimate and so not intimate and um, uh, and so these photos always sort of felt like they um, felt like that, that participant space, like this, that similar um, format. Uh, and that sort of, there's a certain awkwardness um, that I appreciated about them. And then how, I guess, this idea that, that this, um, uh, you know, this amalgamation, uh, you have, you know, they, they exist as individual things, like the plants still exist as individual things, but in the abundance of it, it sort of abstracts Create, creates this abstraction and this it sort of starts feeling like uh, one organism. Um, of course, it is a it's not a finished work, so um, this, you know there's more to be um, had. Um, and then I'm just going to talk about the um, the collection and uh, I'm just. So this would have, um, so Kirk and I 
we would meet on Zoom, and um, uh, so this is, so I don't know why that's, somehow it's, uh, um, I'll start the slideshow and just play it, but I'll just talk about a few things first. So uh, this would have been our first meeting, and uh, I just did it, this quick drawing of what I thought they would look like, what the image would look like. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, uh, but it, I, I got the format r wrong. Um, it wasn't, you know, I think a lot of us think Polaroids, we think like Square or uh, SX-70, and it's actually this professional 600, 667 film. And then that's the first photo that um, uh, he showed me. Um, and so, uh, also, this is, you know, this is so fascinating. I just screenshotted from Zoom, and it's like, this is the point where um, this research gets really messy, you know? Like, it's suddenly in somebody's interior with their houseplants, and, um, uh, you know, the, 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 that, that, that sanitized science is kind of, it's now, it's gone, it's removed, and it's, um, I, I really enjoy the, sort of the intimacy of, of this shift. Um, um, and so, Kirk was, he moved into a lab, uh, and um, he, I'm gonna, let's just play this. I don't know, didn't, oh yeah, yeah okay. Okay, so, uh, and I'll just talk, I'll just talk through. Uh, so he moved into this lab and he found these boxes of photographs um, and he, 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 um, he thought they belonged to Jochen Meyer, who was um, a key member of the plasma physics, physics group at UBC since 1968. And so, so there, there's Jochen in the sweater and it's like, oh, excellent sweater, I'll <laughs> use that. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, and then it was discovered. Not he figured out a few months later that no, it's not. Um, it's not Jochen's research. It's um, a Andrew Ng's uh, research. And he was um, uh, he took he took all these Polaroids in the eighties. So all the the collection is all all stamped. And uh, and so he was one of the pioneers of the laser plasma physics. Um, uh, he was ele elected uh, as a fellow of the American Physical Society. Physical Society? Why yeah. is it called that? <laughs> <laughs> you, you get like a, a medal that's like weight some like. Right. Uh, in, so in 1998, for original contribution to the understanding of optical probing of shock waves and two temperature non equilibrium shock states and for the use of laser-driven shocks in advancing research on high-density matter. So I think the high-density matter is an important part of what he was doing. And so, um, as you can see, like I got, I got, kind of got everything, the cameras and the film, the film is, is done, it doesn't work. Um, um, and so, um, <clears throat> yeah, so the stacks, uh, and, and and so some of the some of the um, some of the images are of these uh, oscilloscopes. Um, an oscilloscope is uh, so he was using foils and using a laser um, that was shot through these foils, and then documenting that. But also um, using the oscilloscope, um, which is make something that the human eye can't see. Um, and, and that a, cam a camera can capture, so it, it uh, uh, displays a voltage signal as waveforms, um, and so it's a visual representation of the variations of voltage over time, so it creates this, um, this signal or the, the wave. Um, How did I do that? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, so this 667 film, Polaroid film, it's at this very high, high speed, medium contrast, coderless print, um, and, and uh, it was designed for this kind of scientific research. And I guess um, uh, this is the, some of the foils, which was such a beautiful thing to open up and discover, like, it's like, oh, I want a bro brooch out of that. Like, there was just, like, such, such beauty in the collection. Um, and, and also there's, like, this sort of, this all this uh, unknown, um, what any of it means, uh, 
um, which is um, Kirk and I are kind of, um, you know, Kirk and I talk a lot about the value, the shifting of the value, um, and how he's he's quite a, Kirk, the physicist is quite attached to these uh, the beauty of these, and he, he felt like the science the science story has been told, um, and he's really um, keen on on the vi like the the visual story, the visual potential of of these, and and the interaction with others, um, um, and so it, it's also this um, I guess this. Uh, uh, the idea, of the, uh, like the, the parallels that science and photography um, uh, run together. I, I'm just going to read you a little blurb from um, this book I found recently called Science and Photography by Kelly uh, Wilder. And um, she, she talks about how science has always been integral to photography's material and conceptual identity. And many scientists became equally dependent on photographic materials. Um, Throughout the history of the medium, scientists in such disciplines as chemistry, physics, have regular altered photographic processes and the process of uh, photographic ca capture. Photography has in turn enlarged existing fields of scientific study, created new avenues of research and connected science and the public in unprecedented ways. I mean, you can see like for the, for the, um, uh, the public's understanding, general understanding of, of, of science to have it in a photographic form was uh, uh, incredibly useful. Um, and the fact that it could be disseminated um, because of the reproductive, reproductive? <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, just the double meaning just kind of got me there. <laughs> um, so photographer's ability to change the, oh, it's not going. Come on. I guess there's a looping feature that, um, that you might just have to put it, um, select the first image on the PDF. So selecting all, and then, oh, sorry. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just do that. Manual, oh okay. I'll just do, I'll just go backwards. This is, yeah, this is one kind of, I photograph one stack. Um, so uh, also Kelly Wilder talks about uh, photography's ability to change the time period in which observation, um, observations are made. So slowing it down, speeding it up, freezing it, and making uh, multiples of the same moment from different angles gave scientists a new observational tool. Scientists could direct their observations away from real time and towards uh, photographic time. Not only could they observe at different speeds, but they could also um, preserve um, their observations for later use and comparison. The other thing that is um, I really appreciate about, about this collection is that it has a very um, conceptual art aesthetic to it. I've come from that. I went to NASCAT, which is um, Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, which is a very um, conceptual-based education. And uh, conceptual art was all about, I mean, you know, it was like a, a, a index cards and no color and um, uh, systems and um, sort of a whole re reduction of no, like nothing decorative, nothing too beautiful, nothing extraneous. Um, and so, I think my, I respond to this collection because it, it it has all those things that I've used and appreciate, but it also has um, this incredible uh, beauty, uh, and and in a way. Um, in the, in the sense that I like to use those things that are in the background, um, this is this is like the, the secondary beauty is the secondary element or the byproduct. Beauty is the byproduct of um, this collection. Like like if you, to see this image in person, it's like you know it, you know you know I had that those photos that were had that lamination, gold lamination, and so as the as you hold it in your hand, it has that shifting light, and um, so it's just. 
you know, these these experiences with the collection are, are um, extensive, and um, you know, this is like these these are like carved into the um, the photo surface the, these notes, and um, so the you know it's just kind of full of surprises, and um, I think Kurt. Uh, I'll go to the page where Kurt describes what things are. I don't know what. Oh, that looks like a hand, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. So, so I could, you know, I can just see how there's some sort of different entry points for other artists to engage with this work, um, and um, I just, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm sort of thinking of this, moving this towards more of an installation that uses, but then also sharing the collection to, so it gets activated um, uh, by several people. So uh, I think that um, that's probably, I don't know what time it is. That's good, yeah. Sorry, a little long. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Thank you so much, Kelly. It was really Term, it's like before an image is developed, it's there, and you can't see it, but it's there, like in theory. So, um, and then you you develop it, and, and, and it reveals itself. So it's similar. Yeah, I don't know why I got excited about latent, but what say their question again? No, I just exactly like we've been reflecting on on that because the, the difference between, for example, the vase which you see in sort of that early thinking about your earlier installation. Mm -hmm. Versus uh, what it means to create a work or think about creating a work about something that is unseen or you don't see or in, in capturing that. Mm -hmm. something that you're interested in. Yeah, yeah, and I did. Um, I, I I didn't actually show that Pete this work, but uh, recently I I think when it was a struggle to I think artists had a hard time being. It's so annoying that it won't play. Uh, artists had a struggle being in their studios and there was sort of this feeling of um, futility, like well, what am I making art for? Like, uh, mm -hmm. And so I started making work that was just sort of blank and it was just a, the, this big sheet of the acetate with this very faint color on them and, and um, uh, the, it had no content, uh, it was barely a thing, uh, but it felt like the, the, the right thing to make it that that time and, and so that um, also like the viewer the, the viewer comes with um, all their own images and their own um, um, subjectivities and so sometimes it's, it's nice to leave space um, for, for, for the viewer um, and, and I, I try to think about that and um, that um, balancing out like the you know the, the piece in presentation house with the chairs it's like how do you, my, the goal for me was how do I make an image without an image being present? And so the fact that it was the, I guess I'm interested in, you know, the, I guess Club 29, the, the objects the, that I was performing, I guess that was also like creating an image without an image being present. So um, animating those, those objects from those things. So yeah, that, 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 the, the, that invisibility or the, the latent image is like sort of a, something I always kind of dipped into a little bit. Uh, like that 
challenge of it. I give my students a, a assignment like that, like um, to create visible work in a corner sometimes, but you know, <laughs> invisible work, and it's really it's a, it's a, it's an interesting concept to think about. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're still engaging with uh, the physicist Burke and, and Professor Ng, Andrew Ng, and yeah. like, or will you be and will you be continuing dialogue with him throughout yeah. the residency? Yeah, like I, we haven't. I think that's our next meeting is going to be t t on Zoom, which will be great because then I can record Andrew talking to Andrew and holding up photographs and you know asking him. Well, things like actually, some photos are why? Why didn't he throw that away? <laughs> you know, like there's these moments of of subjectivity, I guess, that come in. It's like, oh, that's a totally useless image, but it's there. And um, I think our attachment to an archive, and also I relate to that mindset. It's like, oh, that's that might be important, um, and it's not. And <laughs> you, you know, like like some images are so. And they, they would have deteriorated over time, but then some images obviously were just, there was no information. Like that, that, you know, though, yeah, so, um, yeah, and also, uh, just, um, yeah, just little bits of information that I think will be fascinating to get from him. Uh, and and Jochen, Jochen, whose collection we, first thought of was he just he just died this year 
And so I think it it's, would be important to talk to Andrew um, and you know while we're involved in the in the residency and, and to see what he thinks. I, I think also that this collection is I sort of was describing Kurt was telling me it's like this this is like the germ of his research and I I sort of think of it as I've always loved, like, you know, when you go into a thrift store, well, not everybody does that, but you go into a thrift store and those, those, those pots that somebody's first made in a pottery class, and it's like, why are they there? They're so bad, but, <laughs> you know, and I, I started a collection of uh, ugly blue versions of them, and, um, but I think what, for me, it was like, that is that moment of creativity, like, that you are so proud of, and that we recognize that that is a special moment of, um, spark or creativity and and that um, so you, there's that that you value it and that's why it, it it that's why a mother didn't throw it away or you know it ended up ends up in a thrift store so it's in a precarious state at that point um, but valued enough that it made it into the thrift store and so I think this research is really that wobbly blue pot like it it it's just the he said it just was just the beginning of, of a really extensive, um, successful um, research that he ended up doing. And so I think that, that's, a, you know, an also uh, interesting way to look at the collection. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I'm intrigued by your use of the word beauty. You used it a few times. And uh, the reason why I ask is because I've been working uh, with Ingrid Cohen with physicists at Triumph, and they use the word beauty quite often. Do they? And uh, so we've been having this long um, conversation about what does beauty mean to a physicist, what does it mean to an artist. Mm -hmm. And in contemporary art, we don't always use that word or maybe we qualify it. So you did use the word a few times, and I'm just wondering what you mean when you use the word beauty. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a word that I've just recently been able to spit out um, because <laughs> of the, that conceptual background. That was a dirty word. like, uh, uh, and. Um, I mean, I guess it's um. What does it mean? It's it's a sort of odd, abstract, descriptive word because um, it's a really general word, but it's also um, it's a vibrant, it's a vibrant word, and, and, and so I guess that 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 beauty is that the um, uh, that it moves, it, that something moves you, um, and that it has an, an aesthetic sensibility that is, is moving um, and uh, you know that it's that's it's dynamic like you you know that it, it um, I guess I'm just keep thinking of the image the images in this collection and that that they um, uh, they they d deliver um, multiple viewing experiences I guess so how come you're able to spit it out now? Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, I think I think because I've started making work that's a little more decorative or a little more decorative, that's also a dirty word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I, I guess it's been a lot, a lot of years since I was <laughs> forbidden from saying that. I think beauty is becoming more relevant in the art world than that. And that that's something also that we need um, in our lives. We're searching for that more, and, and we're respecting, what, like you know, where beauty is coming from nature, and we we're starting to appreciate and respect that more the more we are um, isolated. And um, yeah, I don't know, just uh, changing times. Mm. Did I answer your question? <laughs> Inker? I, um, I'm curious about like the sense of the detritus, the leftover of a scientific research examination. And so all of that material that's been kind of stored and archived and so on that is no longer useful to the scientists. But as an artist, you know, you're engaging with that, the materiality of that. Mm -hmm. And so in doing that and entering in that, um, does that open a way for the scientists now to like look through it through your eyes? You know, does that give them a different kind of perspective? 
perspective on um, of what they're doing and, and that, that aspect of a, of a language, of a material language, and open up kind of a new way for them to think about what they did or the, the relevance in, you know, in a different way? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I think that's kind of been the beauty of our engagement, artists with physicists, that, you know, we're, we're trying to um, sort out this fruitful confusion, you know, like, um, uh, um, but that we're all kind of getting something from, from each other, like when, um, you know, Kirk, when Kirk and I talk, we, we kind of go, like, beyond um, the collection and and um, I think we're, we're both uh, inspiring each other or um, you know I mean, I mean maybe it's not directly in our work but just in our views of life and um, different perspectives uh, it's been a really nice a, a really nice engagement and useful and I, I mean it's it's sort of um, you know this this idea of things opening up and we're not staying within our departments or our 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 boxes boxes is so healthy, I, I think. So um, yeah, there's it's a really a positive experience. spark of, a, of an idea of this point of what the potential what the potential is and I mean there's also a lot of um, things that have to come in place for me to continue um, this investigation uh, um, and certainly like the every collection gives you a different subject matter um, uh, to, to work with so uh, um, it makes you think yeah it makes you like the, you know, you, they just thinking about the configuration of the room that the, the, the photos were taken, like that's what really um, something I, I'm dying to, to know because being an installation artist, I want to know the space. I want to know how, the, how, how everybody was engaging with the space to take the photo or how it was configured. And, you know, like, um, uh, so I just sort of start, started looking at these images um, really in the last month, so um, there's there's lots to lots to dis discover and and lots of surprises too because there's so many um, and that you know like that experience the other day of opening up I just thought that was an index card and I opened it up and it was like this um, wonderful surprise so um, yeah I think there's lots to discover. I mean, they're all stamped, you know. So every every stamp on the back is a, hand, a gesture of the hand. You know, the hand is really there. And there's all these interventions in the photos, like light leaks or God knows chemical things that happen that are, are really fascinating. So um, I think because I'm somebody who who really appreciates the um, the uh, like the these interventions that kind of uh, happen without you deciding on them. Um, th th this collection is kind of full, full of those those things. Um, so it's it's kind of like you know other things are are um, are are creating their the, you know their own input. Or, yeah, involuntary. I guess they, they, there's involuntary um, interventions. I have a really, I, I hope it's a really simple question to answer. You might have already answered it in your talk, but like the graphs that are in the photos, what are they? Like what, what, what are they actually photos 
Oh, uh, like the, 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 the wave, wave? The wave, wave yeah. so that's the oscilloscope. Oscilloscope. Oh. Yeah, oh, because, um, yeah, so the, I'll show you the, um, uh, so now it's done in a digital, uh, with the digital oscilloscope, but, So, um, uh, so, so that's Kurt describing what this means, which I have no memory of. <laughs> <laughs> but Kurt, Kurt also thinks uh, through drawings, so it's quite nice that he does. He's always drawing, um, uh, and um, <coughs> so this is Kurt's notes. So he's he's. He's broken down the kind of groups of photographs. So this is the uh, photographs of the oscilloscope to Tracia showing the beautiful degradation of the photos around the edges. That uh, there's also one index card showing the kinds of cryptic information included to help index the photos back to some data. Uh, and then this is the the foils um, where they would have been shooting the laser through aluminum. Um, foil and uh, film and paper used. I don't know. So, so there's a, there's different shapes and do you know, do you have anything to add to that, Jen? Well, the the oscilloscope tracers are essentially two dimensional plots where the vertical axis is a voltage and the horizontal axis is a time, and so it's it's electronic response to something. I noticed a lot of the pictures uh, had five NFs, which stands for five nanoseconds. So each little square is five billionths of a second long. So this is an extremely fast uh, electronic response to something. Yeah, so there's all kinds of different ways notations. That and then that is kind of like left on the screen of it and can be captured with the photo as a reference. Yeah, and an oscilloscope essentially takes a still picture of something that's happened mm -hmm. repeatedly and very quickly. Yeah, yeah and then there is, uh, uh, some of them are rounded, like the, uh, there was a tube also that came with the photo equipment, so I think he was, they were shooting through a tube to sort of isolate um, I don't know if they, that's like through the two. Yeah, so there's some really simple methods. I do love how these become a film, uh, like a flip book. I've yeah. played around with them as flip books a few times. Um, the, the bridge is like, I'm just, I mean, because about my bridge all the time. I mean, oh, my bridge, yeah, like right. So yeah. I never get rid of most yeah. studies. Also, they like shooting through a foil, also, that somehow